Hello, and welcome to Brookswood Church. We're so glad you could join us online for our service this weekend. Uh, my name is Pastor Sean, and I'm the pastor in charge of our discipleship and our kids' ministry. And I'm joined here by Pastor Pamelina, who's in charge of our youth and community outreach. If it's your first time joining us online today, we welcome you to uh, go to our website, brooksofbaptist.com, to find out more information about our church and everything we do here. Uh, we are excited to announce that we are now holding live services again at the church. We run two services each Sunday, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., and we invite you to come on out. Uh, you have to register, pre-register for these online, and you can do so through our website or through the link in the newsletter that comes out each week. When you come to a service and enter the building, we ask that you wear a mask. You can take the mask off once you're safely seated in a pew at a safe distance from other people. Last week, we had uh, an almost full service at the 11 o'clock and sort of a half uh, full service at 9. So if you really want to ensure a spot, please come to our 9 o'clock service. This fall, we are launching life groups again. Uh, life groups are one of the best ways to get connected with other Christians and to make friends here at Brookswood. And after six months of isolation, I know we could probably all use that sort of relationship. So I'd encourage you all to consider joining a group at the church here. And you can do so uh, through our website at brookswoodbaptist.com slash lifegroups. The Bridges Women Bible Study is starting up again. So please, if you'd like to come, we're meeting at, on Wednesdays from 9.30 to 11.30. And there's also a Sunday online uh, class that's going from 2 to 4. If you're interested in either of those options, please register at women at brookswoodbaptist.com. Uh, let me pray for us as we continue to worship this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this opportunity to worship you. Uh, thank you that we can worship you through song from our homes. Uh, thank you that we can also worship you uh, in person, live, back at the church again. Father, I pray for everyone's safety as we gather. And we ask that you would be glorified in the way that we conduct ourselves. And we ask that your gospel would go forth and would have uh, its way in our hearts, that we would grow in our knowledge and love for you and our love for neighbor. We pray this all to your glory. Amen. far from heaven to send to us we pray let us burn again holy fire from heaven consume our hearts today let us burn again let us burn again Waiting in expectancy, surrender to your sovereignty. We're hungry for true intimacy, Lord, for the things of your heart. breath from heaven descend to us we pray let us breathe again holy breath from heaven revive our hearts today let us breathe again let us breathe again waiting expectancy surrender to your sovereignty we're hungry for true intimacy Lord for the things of your heart holy stream from heaven Send to us, we pray, let us drink again. Holy stream from heaven, bring new life today, let us drink again. Let us drink again. Waiting in expectancy. 
surrender to your sovereignty. We're hungry for true intimacy, Lord, for the things of your heart. first you go before 
you are the last Lord you're the encore your names and lights for all to see a starry host declare your glory glory in the highest Glory in the highest Glory in the highest Apart from you There is no God Light of the world The bright and morning star Your name will shine for all to see you are the one you are my glory glory in the highest glory in the highest glory in the ever compare to you Lord and all the earth together declares glory in the highest glory in the highest glory Good morning, Brookswood Church. I hope you've had a great week. It's uh, been another challenge upon challenges with all the smoke this week, but we trust that you've been able to manage that and stay inside. Hard to get out and go for walks, uh, I understand, but uh, this too shall pass, as they say. Um, I wonder how many of you caught my little, um, I wouldn't say mistake, but uh, I inadvertently attributed the miracle last week about healing of the beggar in the temple to John rather than Peter. And uh, if you caught that, you get the prize. I'm not sure what the prize is, except you uh, win whatever that prize will be. <laughs> so we're going to continue. And actually, I want to stay with that story today. I want to look at why Luke included the story in chapter 3 of the book of Acts about uh, Peter and John going into the temple and in healing this beggar. He had been born blind, uh, sorry, been born lame, and uh, it's, uh, it's a story that Luke includes on purpose. Everything that is in the book of Acts and the book of Luke that he wrote, the gospel, were there uh, on purpose to, to teach a lesson, to give us some instruction, to inform us of God's values, his priorities, and also to set an example or a standard for churches that are going to follow uh, since the time of writing it up to this present day. So I'm going to read through this passage. Again, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke Sorry, Acts chapter 3, starting at verse 1 through verse 11. The time of prayer was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and Peter and John were going into the temple. A man who had been born lame was being carried to the temple door. Every day he was placed beside this door, known as the beautiful gate. He sat there and begged from the people who were going in. 
The man saw Peter and John entering the temple, and he asked them for money. But they looked straight at him and said, look at us. The man stared at them and thought he was going to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold, but I will give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ from Nazareth, get up, start walking. Peter then took him by the right hand, helped him up. At once, the man's feet and ankles became strong. And he he jumped up and he started walking. He went with Peter and John into the temple, walking and jumping (laughs) and praising God. Everyone saw him walking around and praising God, and they knew that he was the beggar who had been lying beside the beautiful gate. And they were completely surprised. They could not imagine what had happened to the man. And while the man kept holding on to Peter and John, the whole crowd ran to them in amazement at the place known as Solomon's Porch. Would you mind just bowing with me in prayer as we begin this message today? Father God, you have instructive lessons for us to learn in this passage. You have actions that uh, you demonstrated for us to watch and to learn. You have uh, values that you are wanting us to incorporate into our own personal life and into the life of our church in this story. So would you reveal uh, your truth to us? Would you peel back the layers to let us see what it is we need to do as a church, but as individuals in your kingdom as well. Guide us down this path to see uh, to be, uh, the, the, the lessons that you have us to learn today and to apply them to our life. So I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So it says a man who had been born lame was being carried to the temple door. Um, this says that more than likely when this young man uh, was born, and I call him a young man, but I think later on we find out in the next chapter that he was actually around 40 years old. So uh, parents, when he was born, were happy. They had a son, but it wasn't that long after that they realized his legs were not working. He had been paralyzed from the waist down. His, His legs were ineffective, inoperative. And so his entire life, up to 40 years, they've been carrying him, um, moving him around uh, as necessary. I I don't know what kinds of helps or aids that they would have had for crippled people in in this day, but it says that they carried him to the temple door. And this was probably a daily activity. This was his job. This is where he went to earn a living. They had every right to think that having a son born would have been a guarantee that they would have been taken care of in their old age, that he would carry on the family uh, business perhaps. But the reality was, uh, in his condition, he probably wouldn't even outlast them uh, uh, in his lifetime, and he certainly wouldn't be providing for them in their old age. In our world today, being lame may be a challenge, but it's not a devastation. Yeah, there's so many different ways of helping those with uh, challenges such as uh, uh, paralysis uh, to get around the limitation, to have a productive and fruitful life. And there's also corrective surgery, there's robotics to help out, but in Jesus' day, it meant kind of a devastation. It meant that there were no good jobs available to him. It meant that he would not likely have a family of his own. He would not make a significant con- contribution to society. And, and the reality was, when people saw him sitting there begging, they were probably grateful that they were not lame themselves, that they were very fortunate to have use of all of their limbs. So his parents would have expected their son to help them out, but instead they lovingly carried him to his place of work each day. Strategic location, just outside the, uh, the temple gates. You can actually see this gate today and the wall, the outside wall of the, in Jerusalem. It's called the Beautiful Gate. It used to be uh, decorated with Corinthian bronze, and it shone bright. It's, it's very elaborate. And so, what a, what a nice place to have to sit. But, um, you know, I, I think about the parents who were lovingly taking him each day, giving him a purpose, a way to contribute to the family, family finances. And I wonder if his mother, from the first day he was born, thanked God that he, um, he was given to them, but also had another prayer. I wonder if she cried out to God for a miracle for a chance that her son could be like others. I wonder if she would pray, God, thank you for giving us a good 
chance at having a child. Thank you for giving us a son, but Lord, hear my prayer. Take pity on my son. Make him like others his age. Give him a chance to have a normal life, a family, a good job. If you would answer this prayer, Lord, we won't ask for another thing. Just hear this prayer, O oh Lord. Maybe her prayer for a miracle kind of became her daily routine. Every, every day when she would say prayers, she would include, God, don't forget my son. God, help my son. The scriptures tell us that the prayers of a righteous man accomplish much, but I also, uh, I also know that the faithful prayers of a loving and devoted and persistent mother get God's attention. So each day he was placed outside the beautiful gate, begging from the people who were going in, and I think the strategy was maybe playing on a bit of human nature because, um, you know, those that have money, uh, they don't mind being generous often, particularly when people are watching. It's nice to know, you know, have people know that uh, you're, you're doing uh, a benevolent act that day. Um, and I think that also, uh, you know, for us, when we see beggars on the street today, and, and there, you can find uh, people begging different places around Vancouver, the lower mainland, we sometimes think that they are homeless, you know, people living on the street, nowhere to go, very little food, very little income. Maybe we assume that they have addiction problems or mental illness, but this man was not homeless, and he was not there by choice. He was not there by any action or fault of his own. He was there as an act of, um, from birth. Some people would have maybe accused the parents. Maybe the parents did something wrong, that God was cursing their son with this affliction. But it's, it's interesting to note in this story, and, and this story actually addresses a lot of different uh, misconceptions or superstitions, I could even say, that people have. His condition, his challenge, was actually going to be used in a very significant way to get the church off to a very strong start. His condition, God would take and use to bring glory to himself and, and be the foundational moment even where upwards of 5,000 people were going to be added to the church because of his condition. So interestingly, I, I believe that this man, uh, if, he is, if he is almost you know, uh, up to the age of 40 years old, he was probably going there for years. He probably had his place. They recognized him. People in the temple immediately says recognized him as the beggar at the gate. So they would have been very familiar with him. And this tells me that more than likely Jesus himself would have passed by this beggar from time to time. Every time maybe he went through this gate. He saw the man. And I, I have a feeling that Jesus knew in his heart what was going to happen to this man. But he, 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 uh, he didn't heal him himself. He walked by thinking in his own, in his own way, this, this man is going to be a special instrument in my father's hands. This man begging at the gate is going to be used in a glorious way to encourage the church that hadn't even been founded yet. I think that uh, this man would have seen Jesus' feet many times walking by, um, never realizing that the feet of that master uh, would transform him forever. So, the Spirit of God was not going to give him wealth and prestige and power. The Spirit, the Spirit of God was going, to, was going to give him wholeness. It was going to give him dignity and the ability to even take care of his parents, to have a family, to have a life, and to be an encouragement. And maybe he was one of the foundational members of that early church in Jerusalem as well. We don't know, but it says that in this story that he clung on to Peter and John. He was forever in their debt. And maybe he was forever going to give glory to God for the rest of his life. So God's timing is always right. Likely, the mother, the parents had, had prayed for him for many years. And maybe they'd given up. I don't know. But God heard those prayers. God saw a special opportunity to use this person's affliction for his own glory. So when we pray, we should assume that God hears us and that he will respond in his way and in his time so that what he does will draw attention to his goodness and his grace. He always has more in mind to do than we ask. 
And we see our life and our situation, our circumstance, our family, but we are just a thread in his tapestry of an amazing picture. And, and he knows when he impacts one person in that tapestry, so many other people around can be impacted. And that day, with this miracle, more than 5,000 people were changed forever because of this man. It says in verse 3 that the man saw Peter and John entering the temple. He asked them for money, but they looked straight at him and said, look at us. You know, uh, most of us probably don't stop to take the time and look in the eyes of those that are begging. We actually try to avoid looking into their eyes. We don't want to make eye contact because then there's some kind of an expectation. And then also, beggars oftentimes don't take the time to look in the eyes because it can be threatening. It can be intimidating. It can be guilt, you know, uh, giving. So Peter says, look at us. So from looking at the feet to looking at the eyes, this was his moment. You know, if anyone ever paid attention to him, likely it meant they were going to give him money or have, engage him in conversation maybe, give him something, maybe some food, a, a loaf of bread. And they kind of disappoint him at first when they start off by saying, you know, um, we don't have any money. <laughs> the truth was probably the beggar, if he had a few coins in his purse that day, had more money than... Peter and John did. But then Peter says to him, I will give you something that I do have, though. And in the name of Jesus Christ from Nazareth, get up and start walking. You know, I can't imagine any more ordinary people than Peter and John. They, had, they were people that worked in, in the fishing industry. They cast their nets each day. They were working probably 10, 12, 14-hour days trying to make a living, trying to provide for their families. They were weather-beaten. Probably their the clothes weren't uh, you know, off the uh, top of the line, uh, probably a bit ragged. Now they've been following Jesus for three years. <sighs> Sleeping outside. I don't know where they were making residence each, each evening, but they didn't have education. They didn't have uh, influence, they didn't have degrees, they didn't have accolades and diplomas. They were complete, you would not even t stop to look at them uh, if they walked by because there was probably nothing that would draw your attention to them. Galileans, they were called as a point of disdain, common folk, simpletons. But what did they have to offer the beggar? Nothing of themselves. They, they had nothing to, to pull out of their pocket and hand to him to help him buy, but what they had was something even more powerful. See, they had been given a gift just a, a few weeks earlier. Uh, the Holy Spirit had been given to them. It had filled them. It had inspired them and, and empowered them to do amazing things, to share the gospel, to make a difference in people's lives. And, and Peter's saying, today you're going to get that gift too. And let's see what the power of the Holy Spirit can do in your life. This gift was meant for sharing. It was a gift more powerful than any person or force or ruler on earth. It was a gift that was meant to transform people's lives forever, and it still is today. A gift that would meet people's deepest needs, a gift that would not rust or decay, uh, but would last for all eternity. And that's what they had to offer this beggar. That's what we as believers have to offer uh, our, the people in our community that we see each day as well. So the, the results of the gift that Peter bestowed upon the beggar, to heal him, to give him his life back, it actually was, it even ran a little bit deeper in society, what was going on, because in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, in the Old Testament, there were some prohibitions that were set out for those who were not allowed to enter into the temple. People that were blind or lame or illegitimately born, barren women, they were not allowed to go into the temple. They were somehow seen as incomplete or defective. And so um, there was a stigma put on those who were um, facing challenges in life, let's say. Those uh, people were seen as maybe cursed of God. They were seen as less than human. And they were not allowed to participate in the full life of the community, particularly when it came to the temple area. Something must have changed uh, in the New Testament time because with Jesus, it says in Matthew 21, 14, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. So somehow maybe it was the outer court of Gentiles or the court of women or something like that where uh, the different stages of the temple, they were able to come and to Jesus and be healed. So what Peter and John were actually doing was following in the steps of Christ. They had uh, Christ's 
uh, priorities and values in mind when they ask the man to stand up. So why? Why would Jesus care about those who were shunned by society or who couldn't do much to contribute to society or those who were even considered a burden on society? When we go back to the book of Isaiah in chapter 61, it talks about Christ here. It's a prophecy that Isaiah is making about the Messiah and what his role will be. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has appointed me or anointed me, and he has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to release from darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vengeance of our God, to comfort those who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion. And I'm going to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And the people will call them oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord in order to display his splendor. When I see Peter and John stopping to heal this man, there is no better picture of the splendor of God, what happens when the power of God comes into a person's life and, in, in, and fills them with his purposes and, and creates in them an opportunity to bring glory to God. This beggar, this lame man, displayed the splendor of God that day, leaping and praising God, drawing attention, not to himself, but to what the God can do in a person's life. So we know uh, that God wants all people to come to salvation. We know that God is not a respecter of persons. Um, but it's interesting in this Isaiah passage that there is a noticeable lack of reference to the powerful, the wealthy, the prosperous, the influential, the content, the rulers, and the leaders. And as you read through the Gospels, the story of the life of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who is it that gave Jesus the most trouble? Who constantly made accusations against him? Who threatened him? Who lied about him? Who tried to discredit him? Who had him arrested and eventually killed? Well, it wasn't the poor and the needy. We'll talk about Jesus' interaction with the self-sufficient later and what role the church plays in, uh, in ministering to those that do have power and influence and wealth. But don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that God loves some people more than others or, or that some people are more welcome in the kingdom than others or that we should care about certain people more than others. That's not what I'm saying at all. But with wealth, there seems to be a sense of self-sufficiency and pride, and an ever-increasing desire for more. And such traits become um, an enormous barrier to overcome when confronted with Christ's kingdom and his values. Values like thinking of others better than yourself, to if you try and save your life, you're going to lose it, to, to be last instead of first, to lead with a servant's heart rather than seeking to be served, to build God's kingdom rather than your own, you see, Christ didn't come to make the wealthy more comfortable. He didn't come to make the powerful more powerful. He came to heal those that were broken, to give peace to those that were troubled, to lift up those that had fallen down, to, to, to bring joy back where there's despair. We see Christ moved with compassion over the multitudes who were like sheep without a shepherd, who were harassed and abused by the wealthy and the powerful, the rich saw Jesus as a threat. The poor saw him as a savior. It's hard for a person of status to be humble and dependent upon God and generous and gracious to others. It's hard, but it's certainly possible. And many of those that have power and influence and wealth have become tremendous blessings in the king kingdom of God and tremendous blessings in the church and in, in, in society and the communities and inspirational and in how they, they've got God first in their life and allowed him to use their positions of influence in a way that can really uh, undergird and, and bring foundations to churches who need that kind of encouragement. I think the point of putting this message, this story, early on in the book of Acts is to remind the church that we are not to neglect caring for those who are of little means. And we are not to chase after those with much because the temptation is to chase after the wealthy for what they can give rather than caring for their souls or leading them to Christ and letting Christ have an impact in their heart. 
The church does not chase after anyone, but we care for everyone. There's a, a famous account of Thomas Aquinas in conversation with Pope Innocent II while the Pope was counting a large sum of money brought in by the church. Records say that Pope Innocent is to have said, You see, Thomas, the church can no longer say, Silver and gold have I none. To which Thomas Aquinas replies, True, and neither can she now say, Arise and walk. So we know that Luke includes each account in his books with a purpose in mind, both when he wrote the gospel and when he's writing the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of, I call it, the Holy Spirit. We have to ask ourselves why he put this story in here and what does he want us to hear or emulate or understand? First of all, I believe this, that when we help the helpless, we help those who cannot repay us, who have nothing to offer but gratitude. Jesus was born in a stable. Jesus was not a person of financial means. Jesus was not a a, a person of, of property or influence or power in the society. Yet he was king of kings and lord of lords and creator of all. He deserved everything, but he had his priorities uh, according to his father. He said, you know, when you clothe the naked, when you give a cup of water to the thirsty, when you feed the hungry, when you visit the incarcerated, you've done it to me. In my research this week, I found out that there's a there's a number of people that have taken time to criticize the work of Mother Teresa for wasting her time with people who have nothing to contribute to the economy. They pass judgment on her and her ulterior motives, as they call them, uh, to share the gospel, <laughs> to convert people. Um, you know, they don't mind criticizing Mother Teresa, but I don't think that these same critics have gone to Calcutta and looked in the eyes of the beggars to look in the eyes of the destitute and to try and do anything to make a difference in their life. They don't see the sense of love and compassion and dignity that she gives those in need. I've often heard people say evangelism is simply one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And it looks, as I said earlier, that Peter and John were just as poor as this, this beggar, this lame man. They didn't have wealth to give, but they had something much more powerful to give. They had bread, spiritual bread, the bread of life to share. And also, this story tells us that they didn't just share the gospel with the beggar, they changed his life. It was like he was born again. He was was given another chance to live life uh, in a different way that he'd ever had before. Now he can do so much more that he never had the opportunity to do before. He was more grateful. I like what it says. He, the man kept holding on to Peter and John. It's like, it's like Mary at the tomb when Jesus appeared. Jesus says, let go of me. Like, <laughs> she's, she's clinging on to him. Like, it's desperate, great, grateful, astounded. All of these things happening at the same time. All he, he, could, he had nothing to offer. He had nothing to give back except his gratitude. And that's all he had to give, and that's what he showed. What a joy it is to make a difference in somebody's life, no matter how small. Peter and John were given the opportunity to do the work of Christ, to continue his ministry. And that's what the church is all about. We continue the work of Christ in our community and amongst one another. When I say the church, I'm not talking about an institution, or organization. I'm talking about you and me. We, you and I are the church. We have everyday opportunities to let this, the power of God work through us to be a blessing to someone else, to, to lift the cloud of darkness over people, to bring peace where there's, uh, where there's trouble, uh, to, to heal the brokenhearted, to comfort those who mourn, to replace a spirit of despair with a mantle of peace. That's, that's what we have the ability to do every day to make a difference in those around us. And Luke wants us to see what Jesus sees when we look at people in need. He wants us to see people with dignity and with a heart of compassion, with generous spirit and kindness. And we demonstrate who our Lord is. We're, we're, we're carrying out his values each day. Maybe you will be an answer to the desperate prayers of a mother for her 
son or daughter who needs darkness to be lifted from their life, who needs to have peace restored, who needs to be taken out of, of the world's temptations and placed in a solid place where God can have his way in their life and give them a new life, a new chance to live again. Can we at least pray about what God wants to do and then follow whatever the leading of the Holy Spirit gives us? I know Jesus will smile if we do. I think Jesus smiled when he saw Peter taking the hand of the lame man and lifting him up, thinking, yeah, I really wanted to do that myself, but I'm, I'm going to let Peter do this. I'm going to let because it's going to have a huge impact on the church. It was all part of Christ's plan. And we can be a part of Christ's plan today in allowing God's presence in us and his spirit through us and Christ in us to carry out his work in our life. We don't have to have the spirit of timidity or fear. Let's be like Peter and John. Let's be those that take the initiative to stop, to look someone in the eye, to ask how we can make a difference. And, you know, it will come at a cost. There's a price to pay for getting involved in people's lives. It can be very messy. God stopped to care for us. He's, he looked us in the eye and he said, I've got a gift for you. I've got salvation ready for you. In the service today, our music following the, the message is going to give you an opportunity to kind of reflect. I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to listen to the worship music that's going to be played Bow your head where you are. Ask God to fill you with his presence, to guide you with his truth, to lead you in his way so that each day you can make a little different. It's a smile. It's a question. It's a, it's a few bucks. Or if it's a, I need to get involved in this person's life, let the Spirit of God guide you each day so we can not just um, play church, but we will be the church. And we will see people's lives transformed regularly. Let's pray. Father God, this is your moment your spirit is moving in the hearts of your people you've shown us your will in this story in the the scriptures you use two of your servants ordinary people no expertise very little training but they'd been with jesus (laughs) they had been with you jesus may we be with you jesus regularly so that when you want to move through us we will respond without hesitation and allow you and your spirit to work through us to make an eternal difference in the lives around us. Thank you, God, for this day, for this moment, for this opportunity you place before us. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulder Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. That it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, 
no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. adore you 
willingly giving all that I can surrender. Could I just rest here a while, letting you whisper my burdens away? In all of my journeys, there's no other place where I find refuge and strength for my weary heart. Thank you for joining our online service today. Please remember to register if you're joining us in person next week. And remember, kids are always welcome, and we will have a special video for them. I hope you have a great week, everyone. Bye.